Welcome to another edition of the Jody Bunting podcast. Today it's called Getting Off Drink and Drugs. We've got Tim Green, also known as Nutrition Tim, who's an online coach, a personal trainer, and a professional Thai kickboxer. He's not to be messed with, guys. Hi, Tim. Hi, how are you doing? You all right? I'm great. Thank you very much. So you're you're near me. I'm in Hatton, you're in Repton, so you're just around the corner. Yeah. And I actually found you on Instagram. Yeah, yeah, I know I post quite a lot on there. So um, yeah, I know it was really cool because I think we've spoken a few times on there as well, haven't we? Is it just your online coaching that's brought you to Instagram or were you a fan before? Yeah, I, I think I was I was a user before, um, but when I started online coaching, it was probably my main form of connecting with other people that kind of thing so it's probably taking off a little bit since I um since I started doing the online coaching yeah now the reason that particularly attracted to me when I first saw you was just your brutal honesty you know whether it's to do with your partner or the kids or whatever's happening you you say it on Instagram and I think people love that and I've got to ask you you tag the cowgirl a lot which I assume is your partner why is she called the cowgirl yeah, so she's got um, a massive interest in like 70s clothing and American history and loves kind of all things kind of cowboy, cowgirl. You should see the house. Um, the house is like, um, we've got like orange and black wallpaper in the f- orange and yellow wallpaper in the front room and orange walls. It's all like different colours and um, very 70s and very kind of cowgirl style. But it's just um, just something that she's got. It's like a hobby for her, really. Um, buying, it, buying clothes, finding them. She's like very um, into sustainability and stuff like that. So buying like old 70s clothes is um, a big win for her, really. So she loves it. Great. But yeah, that's my partner. <laughs> you do sound like a great couple, honestly. It's great. You have oh, fun. Thank you so much. Right. So let's get down to our topic then. So getting off drink and drugs. And you're going to start by telling us your personal story. So when you're ready. Yeah. So it's quite a long one. I'll try and keep it relatively brief. Um, um, so like school, when I left school, um, like 15, 16, I'd never taken drugs really, never, never really drank while I was at school, apart from like the odd party and stuff here and there for like birthday parties towards the end. Um, but like the time that I finished school was around the time that legal highs really got a lot of popularity. Um, yeah. so, and like me and my friends at school were probably like the last some of the last people that you might have expected to end up in a cycle of taking drugs and drinking um but I think this this phase probably like I mean I'm 30 now so this was 10 10 15 years ago um there's a huge phase of a drug called MCAT which was probably the drug that got me um into taking drugs and that that kind of gained its popularity um at exactly the time I finished school so there was a little bit of kind of bad timing there as well yeah um so that started with that and at first it was like the odd bag here on a night out a gram here or there um and like with probably most people who get involved in drinks and drugs that's probably how it starts and it became something that we did every now and then to something that was every single weekend and then it started spilling into the weeks Um, so that probably happened where I was taking it multiple times per week. So, and when I say taking it would be up for one, two or three days at a time, no, literally no sleep over that time, have a day or two kind of off and then do the same again. And that probably happened for a period of around four, three to four years with MCAT probably quite exclusively. Yeah. Um, and then I during that time as well because I was taking drugs I ended up in a crowd of people um first it was kind of football fans so there was some kind of almost kind of football hooligan kind of crowd that I ended up dropping into because of the drug use and that probably exacerbated it as well because if you know anything about that kind of crowd of people they're all doing the same thing um and then it's around Around for around 2021, there was a big switch from MCAT. So the world just suddenly dropped, seemed to drop interest in it. I don't know if it was because people were figuring out how bad it was or whatever, but it seemed to just switch. And for me, that's when things probably got a little bit worse. Yeah. Um, because 
I was taking MCAT um, and I came off that and stopped taking it pretty much, um, but replaced it with cocaine, which was then probably worse from the sense that it was a lot more expensive and then it was also a lot more accessible as well. So um, at this point, how were you even funding it? Um, yeah, so I, I, during the entire time, I was actually holding down full-time jobs, unbelievably. Right. Um I remember once I even, I went on, I used to finish work at 8 p.m. in a call center and then the next day I'd be back in at 8 a.m. Yeah. And I'd go out and just not sleep the entire time and go roll straight back into work the next day. How did you uh, get there the next day? Do you know what? Looking back on it now, I have absolutely no idea. Absolutely <laughs> no idea how I made it. Um, like now, if if I have a bad night's sleep or something like that, I'm like messed up for days. And yeah. like then I just used to go in and, and function and like without and I was always kind of like quite a good performer in my jobs when I was sometimes I, I wouldn't show up so sometimes there'd be instances where I pulled a sickie or something like that yeah. it's quite funny because I did a post on um on Instagram about how when I've, I've talked about obviously bits and bobs about this story before um on Instagram like how uh, I used to ring in sick sometimes and obviously I wasn't sick I was just hung over or I'd not been to sleep yet or whatever and um I've still got a few of my old bosses on um, on social media, and, <laughs> Great. and obviously, obviously they um, they were aware at the time. Um, they weren't silly. Um, yeah. And there's me going, oh yeah, I used to ring in sick and probably annoy my bosses. And my bosses put FYI, Tim, we knew you weren't sick. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I well, know. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was that was the main funding. Um, yeah, that was that was how I funded it really. Um, so that's when you started going on to cocaine, you said? Yes, that's correct. That was the next stage. Yeah, and this is where like, it really started to... Because with MCAT, I don't know how much your listeners know about it, and but MCAT was like, the reason I think people got so bad on it is how cheap it was. Yeah. So, like, in compared... You'd probably say cocaine's probably, like, five times more expensive. Um. So the switch to that was when I started getting it, it started kind of impacting me financially. Um, and obviously then I was having like, yeah, with money issues, it was impacting other relationships around me and stuff like that as well. Um, and yeah, and that's when I also started, I moved away from the football because I got in trouble um, with the police in quite a while ago. Might have been about 20, probably seven or eight years ago now where I was arrested Um for part there was a, a fight between Nottingham Forest and Derby County fans. Yeah. Um, which actually I actually wasn't involved in at the time. And there was other things that I probably was involved in, but I actually wasn't involved in that. So I was actually cleared of that. Um but yeah I moved away because during the time while that was all going on, um it, I wasn't allowed to attend football matches and things like that. So I moved away from that and that's when I more got into um, I mean, I'm, some of them I'm, I'm, I still speak to in that now, but I was more hanging around with more, it was more like um, that gang kind of crowd, that kind of crowd. And I say hanging around with them, um, I was just at parties they were at and stuff like that. But the crowd of people I wasn't with wasn't great. Um, and did you meet them at football or did you meet them? Yeah, so it was all over the place, really. So it was most of it, the, the the connection and the reason that I met a lot of these people was through drug use. Yeah. Uh, people were either um, selling drugs or they were, um, or just ta or taking them. And pretty much everyone in that circle was either, either doing one of those things. And it almost became very normal. Like it was, it seemed abnormal to me when I met someone that didn't take drugs. That's how kind of far away from a normal mindset I was at that point. Is yeah. When someone said to me, oh, I don't smoke weed. I don't take cocaine. I don't drink at the weekend, every weekend. I'm just like, what are you doing with your life? At that point, I thought, <laughs> no, at that point though. I how do you get your high? That, uh, that I, was, I was living this kind of really fun, amazing life and kind of everyone else was a little bit boring. That was the way I looked at things. And now I see... Actually, I was the one missing out. Uh, yeah. Like that was me. Um, so yeah. So then I got involved with more with them a little bit more. Um, and then there's a couple of instances I got beaten up at a party quite badly. As you can see, my nose is a little bit bent. I thought um, that was from boxing. 
No, so that was that. No, not from boxing. No, <laughs> um, no, that I got attacked at a party, um, and then there's just a couple of instances of of events like that that were happening that that kind of then started me on this journey of kind of moving away from it a little bit. But there was a good seven, eight, nine years where, like, multiple times per week, I was I was really hitting it hard with both the m- more drugs, maybe more so than drink. Yeah, and drink was more of a gateway for me, um, and the thing with drink was that was the thing that made it difficult for me to come off it. If I wanted like a social drink, I'd have a drink and I'd be like, "Oh, I'm a little bit drunk now. Let's go and get X, the association." Y, yeah, yeah, um, and that, yeah, and that almost that meant that that became the issue, and I had to come off that as well. For so, what was your turning point then? When did you decide enough was enough? Yeah, so. I think walking back from a party with blood all over my face and be back quite badly beaten up was a bit of a turning point. But I'd say for me, it was more of a gradual process. Um, and I've seen this happen with a couple of my friends that have moved away from it as well. Yeah. Is where it didn't really happen overnight, but over a period of time of probably around a year, um, I started getting really paranoid when I was taking cocaine. Um, I started not being able to socialize so I'm a little bit socially awkward anyway sometimes but it got to the point where I couldn't even get my words out and like I could barely even communicate or um what's the word articulate like even a sentence um when I was on it so the the reason that I initially started taking them was because I found it for and I was lively I was dancing about I'd go and chat to people towards the end it got to a point where I was taking it just to feel kind of normal and then yeah. when I was, it was when it was getting to a certain point, there was paranoia um, and quite bad paranoia. Like I'd be out in town, I'd think everyone in a bar was going to start a fight with me or attack me and stuff like that and that kind of thing. Um, and then, um, sorry, I've just lost my train of thought. So there's the paranoia um, and yeah, and the lack of being able to communicate socially, like I just couldn't get around it. And it got to a point where I just didn't want to talk to people and this thing that, first was like quite fun and social became just like really not fun at all so there's a couple of times where like I'd stop for three months and I'd, I'd go on like a bit of a binge for a couple of weeks and then like that so for about a year that was probably the case and then yeah all of a sudden I was just I did it once and I was really quite ill um I was being sick for multiple days on uh, multiple times a day for days afterwards um and I just felt dreadful I thought like, I can't do this anymore and that was kind of the turning point for me. So realistically, it was finding out that friends weren't some some of them weren't um, weren't really my friends because I got beaten up. Yeah. Um, it was also um, the lack of the lack of fun with it anymore, not being able to communicate, and obviously then the, the paranoia as well. And all of that together, it just became kind of less and less worth it. Um, but what so do you was... think about this um, idea that you have to hit? rock bottom because i know within aa they say you know you've got to hit this point then i heard a recovering alcoholic on the radio the other day and they said no because so many people when they're about to hit rock bottom they actually end up killing themselves and stuff so it's important to say at any point you know you should get recovery instead of waiting for this awful thing that might happen yeah a hundred percent and and i get what they're saying like i think sometimes for for certain i think it's not important to not look at it from a one size fits all approach like I think saying yeah. wait until you hit rock bottom some people's rock bottom like you've uh, which is obviously really sad is um is killing themselves or or, or harming themselves or the people around them yeah um so for some people wait until rock bottom is is not a really good way of looking at it or not a approach but for some others it might I mean I would probably say if you feel like you've got a problem start taking action towards that problem as soon as you can yeah um rather than kind of waiting it and for some people it might even be almost like um not an excuse as such but more almost like well i'll wait until i've hit rock bottom before I start if, if people hear that advice they might delay getting help because they think well i've got to wait until this point where i'm at rock bottom to, to make long-lasting change and that peer, the, the, you know, the whole what's happening in the world, you kind of wait for you to be in that awful position before you do take action. So, yeah, I think that's great advice that I heard on the radio. And it's good that you obviously didn't get to that awful point where you couldn't take any action. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, for, 
Sorry, go on. <laughs> I was just going to say, logistically, what did you do to get yourself out of that situation? Yeah, so in the first instance, the process for me was a little bit of a break away from a certain crowd of people. So socially, it was the biggest, one of the biggest things with me was that as a trigger was social occasions. So unfortunately, I almost had to not stop socializing, but be quite selective over who I went out with, when I went out, um, looking at potential triggers as well. Um, so it was for me that a lot of it was maybe stress from work um, or money stress that was then as soon as I kind of got high or took a drug, I just didn't think about that. And all I thought about was trying to have a good time or what yeah. I doing, whatever I was doing. So, yeah, the, the process for me was first to look at my social circle. I think that's one of the biggest things anyone can do um, because 99% of people who are taking these drugs are doing it socially. So yeah. social circle is a big one. Um, almost planning. I used to plan in my head when I go home as well before I went out. So a little bit of like, not like, um, like meticulously, but I'd be like, right, I'm going to, if I'm going to this event, this is what I'm doing. This is what I'm going to, this is what time I'm going to go home. And just having that plan in my head to execute it. And don't get me wrong at the start, that didn't always go to plan. Yeah. Um, so there's a little bit of trial and error. Self-compassion in this area is, is super important and being self-compassionate and understanding that it's not like an easy fix. Um, that's, that's probably the, the approach that I took. So if I did kind of mess up on one of these nights and I've not given myself so much of a hard time about it and just like, this is part of the process. Let's move on. Tomorrow's a new day. Let's kind of move forward from there. And how, where did exercise then come into the plan or fitness? Yeah. So for me, the, the biggest form of exercise that got me out of it was my Thai boxing because one, I didn't like going in on a Saturday morning after going out on Friday night and getting beaten up when I was hung yeah. over. But it was part and parcel of um, of training. I couldn't, because I was getting involved in fighting relatively early on in my training with Thai boxing. I just couldn't, couldn't the two couldn't run um, kind of at the same time. Um, and did you start the, doing the boxing before or was it something that you did on purpose to keep you busy? Yeah, so I did start doing the boxing before, but I was lazy with it. I, I barely, I went a couple of times a week, never showed up on a Saturday. And it was, so at the start, I was still kind of half in, half out with it. Yeah. But it was definitely think, the thing. And this is something that I've found with clients, I've found with myself and friends as well that have gone through a similar process to me is finding something to fill that void that's left. Because I the biggest thing for me was, one of the toughest things was the like chasm it left in my life after I stopped taking drunk, stopped drinking and stopped taking drugs. Yeah. It was like Saturday weekend, like what do I what do I do now? <laughs> kind yeah. of thing. So um yeah, finding something like boxing was was really well, Thai boxing was really important for me. Um, because like you said, it it filled that gap and it almost because I've got quite an addictive personality. So when I start doing something, I go all in on it. And that's probably, that's a bad thing when it's something like drinking drugs, but when it's training and business or, or, or coaching, that kind of thing, then it's actually a really helpful thing. So it helped fill that void. And that's where exercise, Thai boxing um, all started really. Um, and it really did help at the time. And then how did you get into nutrition and coaching from there? Yeah. So um I didn't like, I wasn't, I didn't suit a desk job very well or working in an office. Um, I liked to be out and about and doing stuff and being active. So the way that nutrition came into it is, to be honest, I wanted to learn for myself in the first instance. So when I was doing my Thai boxing, I wanted to know more about kind of how to perform better, um, how to fuel my workouts and stuff like that. So initially it was a, a an interest, um, which soon became a bit of an obsession. Um, and then I took the plunge, really. I decided that I was going to do my personal training course. I did that before I did nutrition. Um, and then I signed up. I don't know if you ever heard of it's MNU, Mac Nutrition Uni. Um, yeah, I've looked like it up from your site. Yeah. Yeah, um, which is a really good level evidence-based nutrition course. And I did that. But again, at the same time, I was still... I mean, all the other people on the the course, I remember showing up to like live calls and they had like dead nice apartments. And and I was there like not with my camera on because I was sat in a box room with like a, a light bulb in the as the as the light. You made a, a post about this the other day about yeah. saying most online coaches with a Mac. I've got a Mac. I'm really sorry. Uh, yeah, but you were just sat in your bedroom on your mum's laptop 
you know, just for people to see that on Instagram, it really does bring it home. Because also, I think people feel like they have to be at a certain level in life to even have a nutritionist. You know, it sounds yeah. so, um, you know, like I'm a celebrity because I've got a nutritionist, doesn't it? Yeah. But it's not that case at all, is it? It's no, no, case. absolutely. And um, I mean, yeah, when I started, I was literally um, in my mate's spare room at his flat on an airbed with my mum's laptop. I'm not like completely 100% honest. Um and I remember when I graduated, even when I graduated from MNU, when I did the course, um, it was during, it was quite a while ago, but for some reason couldn't do the meet, meet up. And um, they asked us to send a photo and I couldn't even get, and there was no area of my flat that had good lighting because it was like a cave. Uh, it was just yeah. like a number of like, maybe like one sm a small window in each room. It was really dark and it was just quite embarrassing at the time. But now I look back on it like and think actually that was quite a cool thing to kind of go through yeah absolutely but yeah you don't see a lot of it on instagram like you said it's kind of um a lot of people almost like fake it till they make it kind of thing with instagram so they'll put this persona out that they're living this kind of life and then yeah finally they'll start living it and it will seem kind of seamless but for the, me the, it was the problem sorry, is sorry. people like richard branson tell people to do that they say go and get a job and then learn how to do it once you've got the job <laughs> yeah which is not so bad i guess yeah, I mean, it's not so bad in, I guess, some jobs. Nutrition and stuff like that would be something that I'd probably tell people not to try and do with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, then it's difficult with nutrition because you can cause quite a lot of harm, obviously, if you get it wildly wrong. Absolutely. So the other thing I wanted to ask you was you kind of about your family and friends, because I don't know about your family, but my mum, for instance, that kind of generation, they think a drug addict is somebody homeless on the street. They don't yeah. realise that a lot of people who have got issues with drink and drugs are actually among us all right now, right here. Absolutely. Yeah, it's uh, it's crazy. I mean, my mum came from quite a Christian family um, and her mum was very, very religious. My mum less so, but still a little bit. Um, my dad's side of the family are all kind of um, relatively middle class as well. So like, if you'd looked at me walking down the street, I was always dressed smartly, relatively well presented, maybe not at, like after a night out or anything like that. <laughs> but but yeah. like in the normal day to day, I was dressed smart because I was going to work, presented myself well at work. So you wouldn't have expected maybe someone like myself to have been um to have been doing that um in the background and it is like you said people don't realize um how um how common it is and how like socially accepted it is within like like I said when I was in the midst of it all I thought it was weird for people not to do it um and even now like I know a good percentage of people like in their 20s to 20s and 30s are still doing these things quite actively and I think there is a big discrepancy between where people um what people would think of a drug addict like you said as maybe someone who's homeless or yeah um someone taking because it obviously there's a difference generally between people taking stuff like heroin and things like that and then maybe like cocaine and, and that kind of thing whereas i think people's idea of a drug addict like you said is someone on that side but there is also people really struggling in this um this type of person that you wouldn't even expect to uh to be taking drugs because it is expensive. You know, some people, they can't even afford drugs. That's the other reality which people yeah. don't realise. Yeah, absolutely. And um, it's one of those as well, because people get themselves into quite... I mean, I was got myself into debt with some quite um, not very nice people at the time. And there's also that stress amongst things as well. Yeah. Um, and affording it for a lot of people actually means getting themselves into debt and into trouble with obviously not the nicest kind of people. Now, I love this expression you use as a party boy. You say you used <laughs> to be a party boy because that basically sums it up what a kind of drink and drug person is. It's not the homeless. It's actually somebody getting out there, having a good time, isn't it? Yeah, and I think you fall into this this trap that it's fun. And the first couple of times you take it, you think, this is, this is amazing. I'm having the time of my life. And it just anyone out there that's not gone through that or is anywhere that part of their journey is just take is understand that at some point it will get to a point in your life where it's a problem like 99 percent of people there's the odd person who can recreationally use it and just get on about their life but 
the 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 vast majority of people that I've known through doing it myself, through the experiences myself and through coaching others, is that the vast majority of people, it ends up becoming a huge problem in their life and something that they want to stop, but they really struggle with. So wherever you are, if you're at a point and you're listening to this and you're taking it and you think about this is really cool, then just just bear in mind that at some point that's likely to to change and it'll become less fun. Where did your partner come to it? Did you get yourself off it and you were feeling good and you met her or was she part of the recovery? Yeah, so it's a, it's a bit of a, uh, a funny story, actually, because I met my partner um, quite some time ago whilst I was in the midst of the wor- probably the worst bit of me taking drugs. And we met and we went on a date um, and she decided that I was a bit too wild for the time. So <laughs> we didn't actually continue seeing each other back then. And the then, cowgirl telling someone else they're too wild. That's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, and she, um, we actually ended up, so once I'd kind of sorted myself out and I started online coaching, we ended up chatting on Instagram and then we went from there. So it's like we liked each other back then, but I would probably admit and agree with her that I was a bit too wild at the time. Couldn't pin me down. That was the problem. I was all, all over the place. And um, yeah, it was after the fact um so me and my partner have been together two years now so um she definitely keeps me on the straight and narrow though so we're both both quite good like that we're both very active at the weekends and we plan things in we don't massively go out and drink and stuff like that so i think you've done your partying yeah it's done it's (laughs) over (laughs) yeah right so let's talk about helping other people then so if for instance a client comes to you brand new you've never met them before you know what's the basics that you give them to for getting off drinking drugs yeah so first thing that we look at is triggers that's the biggest one so whether they're triggered by stress and whether it's socially so the first step that we go through is identifying them triggers and putting some processes in place to to deal with those so whether it's stress, we'd maybe look at the source of stress and stress management techniques. Um, if it was like social circles, we'd identify that and put in a plan to maybe reduce those or to um, we do something where we even like help them contact friends to arrange something outside of maybe going to the pub. So doing something that's more of like a activity as mates. So finding them fun things to do so they're not sat bored on a Saturday afternoon and decide to end up in the pub is maybe going, right, you could do this with your mates instead and finding them different activities so they can still socialise. The biggest fear that I think people have is when they stop drinking and taking drugs that the, the mates will think that they're boring. Yeah. So we help with that um, in the sense that we help them find other activities and stuff like that to do. And um, do you think this is where AA is so successful because it does kind of give them that community? 100%. I think the community side, and this is something that, um that we do inside of the the coaching as well but the community side of something like aa it's almost like accountability it's the support it's people going through similar things to you so we do have um like a facebook group um we talk i i hold on my account i speak to my clients daily and stuff like that so if any of them have had any issues with that kind of thing is there is someone always there to, even if it's just me sending them a message saying kind of hi how's your day going is any, anything you need help with how are you feeling today that yeah. kind of thing and just having someone there um, and providing them with some real support and real accountability is another kind of way that we look at it as well because again AA they do what they call sponsors which is kind of yeah. your go-to friend so in a way you're being the sponsor but on a kind of a professional level aren't you yeah absolutely I mean the the service isn't kind of it's more it's for people that have had that but we we focus on obviously also the nutrition and the training as well, uh, but also providing them some support and accountability to help with that side of things. So if there's people out there listening that do want to um, stop, but aren't really that motivated to do it, what do you think the main benefits are of stopping drinking or stopping drugs? Yeah, I mean, what the main kind of benefits for me was the first one was the relationship with my family. Um, whilst I was taking drugs, the relationship with my family deteriorated quite badly. Um, and the biggest change I could see overnight was my relationship with the people closest to me. And some people might be watching that thinking, they don't, they're not, they're, if, I don't know if you're like a 20 year old, does that, how much does that matter to you? But at some point it does. And um, yeah, yeah. And it's nice to to have a relationship and your family 
for me is someone that will always be there for you as well and to get them kind of on side and have a good relationship with them super important so yeah one of the biggest benefits is that clarity of thought as well like I used to think that my life I was very unlucky and things were kind of just happening to me when realistically it was myself putting myself in these situations and I was and it was all caused by my own decisions whereas I was always always blaming other people or blaming um kind of bosses at work for for being harsh on me and stuff like that whereas in reality it was all my own actions so understanding that and being able to take the like personal responsibility for it was was a massive benefit of coming off because when you're in that situation for me it, my thought was just constantly clouded yeah um and then finally just like energy levels and um like enjoy uh, enjoyment for life like i was like a zombie when so in between days like of partying and stuff like that if you see me walking down the street I was half asleep if I was catching the bus to work I was getting some sleep on the bus um all that all these kind of things um and now like yeah just appreciating waking up every day and not being hung over not feeling like I'm on a come down or not just feeling generally unwell um that's something that's that's massively underappreciated when you're in that kind of situation of taking drugs and now I'm out of it I can't imagine not waking up and feeling good um that's probably one of the the final benefit there right so again thinking about that new client that's coming to you or somebody who does want to get into fitness what advice would you say just to you know for beginners trying to uh get into fitness instead as a new hobby yeah so completely as a, as a new hobby the first one would be to be patient that i think you, most people um from, you see things on social media, you see things online all the time where people are getting really, really quick results. It's just to be patient and not try to change too much at one go. Um, like when I first started coaching, I was kind of in the habit of giving people a ton of information at the start and loads of different things to change. And suddenly I realized that was quite overwhelming for people. So yeah. I think having patience and, and focusing on a few kind of different habits to change would be rather than trying to do everything all at once would be one of the main things I'd say to people. Um, secondly, is is probably get some, if you are completely new to fitness, um, probably get some support. And it doesn't necessarily have to be like a, a coach like myself, but even if it's just asking someone in the gym for a little bit of help or or maybe even getting yourself a coach, but doing that even just for a period of kind of three to six months is going to give you the tools to kind of, self-manage it for the rest of your life and it will almost fast track you a little bit as well in terms of your learning and find something as well that you enjoy in terms of exercise so many people spend so much time um doing stuff that they hate like moaning about having to run on a treadmill when there's a million different other ways that they could do cardio or do some exercise and i think because we've sometimes put things in a box in terms of what exercise should look like and actually just finding something that's sustainable and enjoyable for you and doesn't feel like a chore. It's probably one of the biggest things as well. And I think this is where like you did it with the uh, Thai kickboxing is so good because you're almost entering a sport, aren't you? And you actually yeah. want to eat well and go to the gym for your sport, for your profession. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And um, Thai boxing was massive for me with that because one, there was always, well, if I do go out and drink, then I might, get my head kicked in during this fight <laughs> so there's also that time. yeah <laughs> but no it's all but also like yeah the, the level of training that you need to and I think a sport's a really great way to to kind of because you've got a lot of when you stop with drinking drugs and that kind of thing and going out you like I said before you've got a big void to fill in your life and something like a sport if you want to get to a good level in a sport you need to dedicate yourself and someone who is someone who's just coming out of that I think is in a unique position to be able to do that really because they've got a lot of spare time that they need to fill and they've got a lot of kind of maybe their minds running they've got a lot of free time at the weekends and stuff like that so to throw themselves into something like that I think is absolutely massive yeah I mean I've got a one of my best friends actually who used to do um who was around at the same time doing drugs that I was He's also got into actual boxing, but he was a couple of years younger than me. So he's done ex pretty much exactly the same thing that I've done, but with boxing. And he's competing Great. at boxing at a really good level now as well. And so it's, like it, you know, it's really weird how many boxers actually come from this drink and drugs background and it just turns yeah. them around, doesn't it? It's amazing. Yeah, it, 
I always, I almost feel a little bit cliche talking about it sometimes because pretty much <laughs> yeah. every boxer you've ever heard with, talks about their troubled youth and <laughs> all of these things. And um, but it does attract that type of person because I think with a lot of combat sports, you kind of have to have a little bit of a that side. I don't know, a little bit of a screw loose really to get into it, competing at a high level. You need to. Yeah. Um, it attracts a certain type of person. Um, and I Which think for in the ring is perfect. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And you, but you need someone as well that gets obsessed with something because if you're not obsessed with kind of combat sports at that level, yeah, you're going to come up against someone that is, and you're going to end up having a really having a bad day. Um, but yeah, it, it's needed to to do it at that level. And someone who's just come out of of something that's so intense as like a drug addiction or a drink addiction, it's uh it's a good avenue to channel all that kind of extra kind of energy they might have right now let's talk about my favorite subject food okay yeah. nutrition so again thinking back to that first person that beginner what is the the basics do you think for nutrition and food yeah so I think with nutrition and food I think again it's the basics for me is is getting rid of this all or nothing kind of mentality that so many have around food it's either they're eating really, really well, and it's like this very kind of um, typical kind of diet food where people are having like chicken, broccoli, rice, that kind of thing. And they think, right, well, I'm doing amazing. And they manage it for a week or two, and then they'll spend a week or two eating and eating McDonald's or that yeah. kind of thing. So it's, the first thing that I think is one of the most important things is to try and get away from that all or nothing thinking. Um, and something that we do even when people have got like specific trigger foods. So if they have a, normally they'd eat a chocolate bar and that would send them way off track for days or something along those lines is we actually help them quite overcome that fear food and include stuff like that in their diet most days so that it doesn't become that all or nothing trigger for them that has in the past. And that's, if we can overcome that, that's a lot of the issues that m most of the people I work with face is this all or nothing mentality around food. And with regards to actual protein and stuff like that, that a lot of men in the gym industry, the nutrition industry, you know, it's yeah. all about protein. What are your yeah. thoughts on protein? I mean, I think there's probably, yeah, an o not an overemphasis on protein because it's important, but I think the amount of protein that some people are told that they need, I think it's it's very specific to a person's goal. So. Yeah. Protein helps with stuff like appetite, uh, muscle retention when you're trying to lose body fat and stuff like that. Um, and it also has a big role in immune function as well. So it's it's really quite important for someone who wants to try and lose weight or affect their body composition in a pos positive way. However, I think what the problem is most of the time is when you've got like a bodybuilding coach prescribing the same amount of protein that like a bodybuilder might need. And when you've just got someone who's like, who just wants to maybe lose a little bit of weight, who hasn't got like a very extreme goal. So it's maybe the amounts that are thrown about that are a little bit kind of off sometimes. But yeah. actually, I think protein is really, really important for, for good nutrition. And it helps, definitely has its biggest impact on appetite, which we know can, can be really difficult when you're trying to maybe lose weight or something like that. For anybody who's struggling with alcohol or maybe just generally drinking too much, do you think there's any nutritional advice that, you know, have you given any nutritional advice specifically for anyone with drinking issues? Um, not like it may be, there's no kind of, I wouldn't necessarily recommend any certain food or any kind of diet or supplement or anything like that. But I think looking at their overall dietary pattern, how that's impacting energy levels and their sleep and stuff like that, because it, it can have this downstream effect where if you're not eating well, you can feel lethargic, which can then affect other areas of your life, which can kind of snowball into into drink so getting things to a point where you feel like you've got energy and you've got a bit of kind of motivation for life and that kind of thing is really key and obviously that can be impacted through good nutrition and then that can impact alcohol but no no like specific foods or, or anything as such now i've got to ask you about this instagram quote you often see i think i once saw it on itv as well on the sugar-free farm where yeah. a nutritionist once said that sugar was more addictive to drugs is this true <laughs> or is this not true um i can i can only i can speak from my experiences 
I can tell you that I've never um I've never gone out to get a bag of sugar at four in the morning. Um <laughs> so <laughs> no, but some of my slimmers have. <laughs> <laughs> no, but in terms of in terms of it being more addictive than cocaine, um, from my perspective, I just can't see it. Um, yeah. In terms of, I can understand why sugar does have um, it can feel like an addict an addiction with sugar, a hundred percent. But um, for me, yeah, it, it's it's hard for me to when I hear that, I'm, it kind of triggers me a little bit in the sense that. <laughs> Like yeah, um, yeah. I I, I think what, why you wouldn't want a diet massively high in refined sugar, really ever. Yeah, it's um, it's. I think there's a lot of demonization with sugar, um, that maybe in some instances isn't 100 percent warranted. Um, so yeah, that quote on Instagram, I, I'm not not a massive fan of that. I've got a <laughs> feeling the people that are saying that have probably never taken drugs before. Yeah, exactly. And I think they, they, ha they have researched it. And I think the I read a study on it and they were talking about how the addi only like the addictive like behaviors around sugar. And this was in mice. So we take it necessarily with a, a little bit of a pinch of salt because it doesn't always translate to humans. Yeah. But with sugar, they found that intermittent access or restriction to sugar caused more addictive like tendencies than anything else. So like restrict so i think they came to the conclusion that that maybe sugar restriction or carbohydrate restriction could also potentially play a role in in craving it as well yeah right let's talk lifestyle so the you know sleep digestion uh even a spiritual life you said there about your family being from a christian background what lifestyle advice do you give your clients yeah, so it's a tough one because it's it's obviously very individual and to, to their needs, but we focus sleep is probably the biggest lifestyle thing that we focus on. Um I think sleep like it's if you're trying to change your body composition, whether it's trying to lose weight or whether you're trying to perform better, sleep is going to be the biggest impact on all of those. You can have your diet in the right place, you can exercise well, but you probably know this that if your sleep's not in the right place, then you're gonna struggle to kind of see progress you're like trying to put out multiple fires when you're not sleeping properly and you just end up in a, in a bit of a mess so um sleep's the massive one and we focus on sleep duration as well as sleep quality um so focus on that quite um, quite specifically so things like eye masks we look at the temperature of the room um blackout curtains that kind of thing um setting um kind of sleep and awake time so they're in a proper routine the sun before screen thing as well i don't know if you've come across that um where the the advice is to get some sun in the morning before um before you look at your mobile phone screen and that yeah. can have this massive downstream well, massive effect through you could like a circadian rhythm which is like basically your body's clock and it helps you if you can get some sun in the morning before um before you kind of look at your phone or early on in the day it kind of sets your body clock up that you've you've woken up and then you'll fall into a little bit better of a um a cycle with it so that would be the first thing we look at is sleep because we can do stress management we can do all these other things but if sleeps if you sleep deprived it's it's really like an uphill battle really yeah so sleep's a massive one lifestyle would also look at stress management so if people are chronically stressed again that can have a really massive impact on our health and our ability um our um what's the word um our possibility of like getting disease risk and stuff like that yeah so i can 100 help with that so stress management's a massive one and that can be either, like sometimes we look at outside of like the traditional methods for stress management as well because some of my clients when if i ask them to maybe meditate they'd maybe look at me a little bit funny yeah. so we find other <laughs> we find other ways to manage stress as well as well as just like your traditional ones so so for some people getting out and having a walk or going to a boxing class or doing some form of exercise can be their way to kind of to kind of de-stress alongside maybe other more traditional things like meditation and breathing and that kind of thing have you ever been to the etwal torah center the meditation center yeah <laughs> fully enough i have um but not not recently um are we used to when i was like a late well uh, maybe like 15 16 we used to go cycling up there yeah and uh with the family and my mom and stuff like that and we used to go in there there so we've been up there a couple of times i've never been in and actually meditated there have you been there 
Yes, the, the the good thing is they do a free meditation at lunchtime, which is just 20 yeah. minutes and it's a non-religious meditation. Yeah. So and all it is basically is a breathing class. So you sit yeah. there, you follow our instructions and that's basically it for 20 minutes. But you are right. When I suggest to my clients about meditation, they're just completely freaked out and they imagine people sat on pillows, cross legged, like humming. Yeah, exactly that. And I think um because my my kind of um, the person that I generally work with, I mean, don't get me wrong, I work with quite a varied people, varied kind of people generally. But the the mo the person that I attract the most tends to be people quite similar to myself. So, yeah, people that have maybe come away from drinking drugs have maybe been a bit of a bad lad in their younger years, that kind of thing. So again, they're even more kind of um, shocked when it comes to meditation being mentioned or. Or kind yeah. of overwhelmed a little bit because they're like this really isn't this is really outside of of kind of their comfort zone so we look at that i try and encourage them to maybe start with like a minute one minute or two once or yeah. twice a week or something like that if they want to but generally we look at other areas so we look at the input we look at stress as like two different ones input of stress so what's causing them to be stressed is it their job is it their family is there anything that i can help them with or suggest that they maybe do from that side of things and then also because if there's loads of stress coming in, even if we're doing all the meditate, meditating and all of the other kind of breathing techniques, if there's lots of stress coming in, we're going to struggle. So it's it's also looking at minimizing stress coming in as well as uh, managing that stress that comes as well. Because me and you are quite lucky because we live in kind of a, a semi-rural location where actually just going a walk around the village for us sometimes can be a bit of a meditation you know you've got the blue skies you've got the green grass so yeah I think it is really hard for people to just turn off that's what I find I don't know what whether you you know with city clients yeah well I can speak really a bit from Perth because when I oh, I did live in the city when I was um, I lived in Derby when I when I was going through kind of my worst phase so I think there is a massive difference when you're in a in somewhere like like Repton, like here, like now. I can go out and I've got fields pretty much like a two minute walk, so it's nice. Yeah. I can get that headspace. Whereas before, if I walked out my front door, all I'd see is kind of it. Well, it wasn't the best area that I lived in. Um, it was like Normanton area in Derby. So when I went outside there, it was people that were in a similar spot to me a lot of the time or a similar situation to myself so it, there was no real getting away from it whereas like there is a lot more um like you said like it is a bit of meditation just going out for a walk and some people find that even in the city like I've got clients that like if they can get out for an evening walk or one in the morning before work it really sets them up sets them up for a really good day yeah so it can help um regardless of where you live but definitely helps having a bit of nature on your doorstep I asked my Facebook group of my clients, I told them that I was speaking with you today. Um, and I said, have you got any questions for Tim? As you know, people are so reluctant to talk about drink and drugs. But yeah. I did get one uh, private message that said um, he stops drinking for 15 days. And then once he gets to that point, and it's happened several times, he just completely goes back on it. So what is there something about this 15 day cycle? Not, not as, not generally, but it might be something specific to this person that's asked you the question. Now, one thing that I've found quite useful when people are looking at like almost like a bit of a streak where they've not drank for something that I've found quite helpful is not necessarily trying to. So, looking at instead of going right, I'm going to completely stop and I'm never going to drink again or whatever, and I manage 15 days. So just thinking, right, I managed 15 days last time. So this time I'm going to manage 16 or, or literally just trying to beat it last time. So instead yeah. of trying to kind of go, oh, I'm going to cut everything out. And like you said, and he's only managing a couple of days or 15 days is, is kind of going, right, kind of like a habit streak and saying, right, I did it for 15 days. That's next time trying to do it for 16 or 17. As long if he keeps, if they keep doing that, not only did they improve the length of time they've not drank for, but also if they only did that over a course of a year, it probably massively reduced the amount of times that they drank over the course of that year because they're not drinking. They're kind of starting again each time that they drink. Yeah. So, so yeah, I'd say don't put too much pressure on like trying to completely stop, but just maybe go, right, yeah, try and kind of beat what you did the time before. 
that would probably be one of the biggest things. In terms of it, what I would look at as well is potentially, again, like triggers. So what triggers are, are kind of happening after 15 days? What's the reason that then you're going back to drink? Is it because you've got loads of social stuff on? Um, is it because something's happened at work or with a relationship or something like that? So identify some triggers, but also kind of take a, I know that it's not always, it's difficult to take it as a lighthearted thing because it's quite personal when it's stuff with, drunk, with drinking drugs, but yeah, kind of see it more as an opportunity to beat your, your score from before, beat the, the amount of days you lasted them before and not kind of, and be self-compassionate when you do drink and don't be like, oh, I've ruined everything. I need to now kind of leave it for a bit and I'll try again in a few months or whatever. And just going back to that subject as well as not talking about it, do you think you kind of have to open up to your family and friends that you've got a problem or do you think it is something you can work on privately? So, yeah, it's that's a tough question. Um, so with myself, um, I, yeah, so my parents found out um, and now I'm like really open and honest with them about it. Yeah. Um, I, I think... For most people, you probably need to to be honest with the people around you. Um, I think keeping it to yourself, it's like a lot of things. It's because a lot of the time it's not just drinking drugs as well. It can be kind of like affecting mental health and stuff like that. And that's obviously something that we need to talk about more. So, yeah, finding someone, it doesn't necessarily have to be kind of family but finding someone that you can be open and honest with about it and just talk with about it, like in a non-judgmental way, is probably a really important thing for a lot of people. Because I think one of the reasons that a lot of people don't talk about it is, is judgment from other people. Like even now, like it's not the easiest thing for me to talk about um, and open up on. So, um, because it's like you said, people don't, you, um, you said with your Facebook group that people don't always want to talk about it. And it's the same thing. It's a, it is a really personal thing. And yeah, but I do think, because I had friends that I could open up to and talk to about it that had gone through similar things. I think that definitely helped for me. So I'd, I'd encourage anyone to at least find one person that they can speak to and feel comfortable speaking to about it. Great. Right. So we're nearly done. So just to conclude the whole podcast and again, all the advice for people, what would you say is your top three tips for coming off drinking drugs? So top three, um, social circles look at your social circles um to find someone that can support you and hold you accountable um to some extent and finally find something to channel um your energy or your um kind of obsessive almost tendencies that people can have around drinking drugs and channel that into something whether it's a sport whether it's a hobby whether it's learning a new skill something like that can be massively powerful and you'd be amazed that because if you are the type of person that I am, if you really put all your energy and devote yourself to something, you can really kind of pick it up very quickly and get really quite good at things. So yeah, I'd, I'd definitely channel that energy into something positive as well. Great. Now I'm asking all my podcast guests, because it's the start of the year, what are your yeah. personal goals for this year, Tim? Yeah, so um, there's a couple. Um First one is to get back in the ring. Um, I suffered a knee injury at the end of last year. Um, and I, so I haven't been, I wasn't able to fight at the end of last year and I'm still recovering a little bit from that. So the first one is to get back in the ring, 100%. Um, second one is to eat, eat more vegetables, even though um, I'm a nutritionist, we, I think I probably need to eat more vegetables. So that's a massive one for me is to, to over the Christmas period, it was, obviously everyone's diet goes down the drain yeah. a little bit so definitely get more vegetables and more plants into my diet and then finally just to keep growing my business in a, in a positive way and just help as many people as possible with that so they're, they're probably my top three is to just improve the amount of vegetables that I'm eating um, get back in the ring and, and continue growing the uh, continue growing my business I'm currently doing veganuary tip it's a great way to eat more veg because you've just yeah. got no other options. <laughs> That's one way of doing it, 100%. 100%. <laughs> How are you getting on with it? How are you finding it? Um, I'm starting a new love for Bang Bang Cauliflower. I don't know whether you've oh, ever okay. had that before. 
Yeah, I think is it is it like a spicy sauce that they put on it or something along that? I know that I've heard of like bang bang chicken or something like that. So I'm yeah. guessing it's something along them yeah. lines. Yeah, I've I've just tried to make it healthier by just basically dousing it in olive oil and putting some chili flakes on it. But it's yeah. actually quite nice compared to tofu and all those weird things. Yeah, I, to, tofu is something I've not been able to get on with. I have. I've eaten I've have eaten plant based for a period of time in the past where I've had like plant based meals and stuff and it's generally pretty nice. I can't I do struggle with with like you said the tofu um, and some of the other stuff, but generally I think it's a pretty good way to eat. I think most people improve their diet a bit by going vegan because most people just end up like you said eating more vegetables yeah. because <laughs> <laughs> you've got nothing else. Um, so yeah. Um, I hope that goes well for you anyway. I hope that's... Uh, Thank you. Okay. Nearly there. I'm getting there halfway through. <laughs> so where can people find you online? What's the best place to find you, Tim, if people want yeah. help? So best place to find me is Instagram, 100%. Um, I do use Facebook and TikTok. I'm kind of trying to get to the grips of, but it doesn't really, <laughs> doesn't really make too much sense to me at the minute. I think I just um, go on there and just if i've made a video for instagram i'll generally just share it on tiktok and that's about as far as it goes but instagram's the main one so at nutrition tim on instagram or tim green on facebook um is the main place you can find me online and yeah i'd love you to come drop us a follow and just see some of the stuff that i'm putting out and as a coach what do you do you do courses do you just do weekly coaching is it a you know meet me for a few hours and i'll solve all your problems what is your solution yeah, so um, I've got a one to one coaching service, which is um, it's, it's run. If people are local, then I offer the option where I can meet them in a coffee shop or something like that for a consultation. But generally, it's a, we start off with like a consultation. We discuss their problems, find out um, what they're struggling with. And on that call we'll, between us, put like a bit of a plan in place to deal with it. And then, yeah, so we, we give them the plan hold them accountable daily. So I just message them, speak to them on a daily basis over WhatsApp. And then we we do like a formal check-in every every week. And then we get back together on Zoom or meet up every four weeks. So it's all online, most of it. But we do, if someone is local, I offer the opportunity to go and have a coffee with them or something like that. Great. That sounds really, continue with your work. Honestly, thank you so yeah. much for sharing your, not only with me now, but just yeah. keep on doing what you're doing on Instagram. Because honestly, it's amazing. And I don't know how the algorithms actually work on Instagram, but I found you and I hope lots of other people will as well. Yeah, no, I I, I try not to worry worry too much about the algorithm. People moan about it, but again, it's one of them things completely outside of my control. So I think the best way to be, it's just to be consistent with with putting information out there. And eventually I think you'll, you'll get where you want to. Yeah, great. Well, thank you so much, Tim. No worries. Thank you so much for having me on. And good luck with eating your veg. Yeah. No, it's going well so far, actually, to be fair. Um, right. It's never too bad, but yeah, we just uh, just a little bit more focus on it, that's all. Wonderful. Perfect. Right. Thank you, Tim. Bye for now. No worries. Thanks for your time. Please remember to like, give me a comment, share with your friends, and of course, subscribe to my channel. Thank you.